بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. We begin with Allah's blessed name. We praise Him and we glorify Him as He ought to be praised and glorified. And we pray for peace and for blessings on all His noble messengers and in particular on the last of them all, the blessed Prophet Muhammad sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam. As we greet you from the studios of the Islamic Broadcasting Network, here in my native island of Trinidad with Assalamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh, your brother uh, Imran Hussein, and it is Signs of the Times, one more time. And we have several subjects to address today in a limited amount of time, so we'll break them up. Uh, and. Uh, we, we want to begin first with some news, uh, and that is that uh, my visit to Greece, my first ever visit to Greece, is now scheduled from November the 1st, inshallah. We pray that Allah might open the way for my travel to take place. I, Trinidad and Tobago is still, the borders are still locked down uh, for several months now, but I applied for and I have received permission to depart Trinidad, and I have a confirmed flight. We pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may make it possible for me to travel. Uh, so from November the 1st in Athens, uh, six days in Athens, and then we drive, we drive along the coast to the northern city of Thessaloniki. I don't know why, but it seems as though my heart is being drawn closer and closer to Thessaloniki. Um, so we should be in Thessaloniki from uh, November the 7th, um, at least for one week. Um, it's a very big hotel, the Queen Olga Hotel, and if you are coming, uh, I'm getting emails from Albania, uh, my students who, because Albania is just next door to Greece, uh, who will be coming. I'm getting emails from Macedonia, uh, but nothing as yet from Montenegro. I would be happy if uh, some of my Orthodox Christian brothers in Montenegro who just waged a successful struggle in Montenegro, my congratulations to you. If you were to be able to come and from Kosovo, uh, nothing as yet from Bosnia. Uh, Belgrade might be too far. When I was in New York, I used to drive regularly to Toronto, eight hours, eight, eight and a half hours via the Niagara Falls. Uh, Belgrade, I don't know how many hours you are from Tassaloni, Tassaloni, Sofia, Sarajevo, Banja Luka, Zagreb, uh, Pristina in Kosovo. If you can come, mashallah, otherwise just Albania and Macedonia. Um, I will be very happy to welcome you. Send me an email uh, so I can try to negotiate a discount price for you at the hotel. Uh, the next news is that Constantinople in the Quran uh, will now be translated uh, sh shortly, which another two weeks should be finished, translated to Greek. Alhamdulillah, we got, <laughs> we got the funds to pay the cost of translation. We got the funds to pay, we hope, enough to pay the cost of printing and we're trying to negotiate now to put the book to be printed uh, in Greek in Athens in time 
for my visit. So please make dua wherever you are that Allah might open a way, inshallah, for this visit to take place to Greece. My first ever, the reason why I have chosen Greece when there's so many other parts of the world inviting me is because when Hagia Sophia was converted for the second time, sinfully so, to a masjid, no people showed greater pain and suffering than the Greek Orthodox Christians, more than Russia, more than Bulgaria, more than others. And this is why I chose Greece, that I will go to Greece uh, as my first stop on this travel this time. Uh, it is today, excuse me, it is today the second day of the month of Safar. I saw the moon myself um, on the night uh, after Salat or after the day of Juma. And so yesterday, Yom Musab was the first day of Safar. And today, Yom al Ahad is the second day of Safar. The, men, the month of Muharram has now ended. And we are now in the month of Safar. How do you know when the month has ended? Let me explain <laughs> one more time. If you have not calculated the beginning of the month, then you cannot know the end of the month. So you have to be able to know the beginning of the month. So when the 29th day of Muharram came to an end, on that evening at sunset, you look for the moon. Did you hear that? When the 29th day of Muharram, the month of Muharram, or any month comes to an end, then on that evening after sunset, you look for the moon. Where do you, <laughs> where, where do you look for the moon? <laughs> you look for the moon where the sun is setting. That's where you look for the moon. And if you do not see the moon, then the month will continue for one more day and would automatically end at the next sunset. <laughs> I hope this is now understood. The month will then have 30 days. And at the end of the 30th day, the month will automatically end. But if you see the moon at the end of the 29th day, then for those of you who have been reciting the Quran to khatam or to complete the Quran every month, when the moon is seen at the end of the 29th day, as happened here in Trinidad on the night uh, uh, after the day of Juma, when the moon is seen at the end of the 29th day, you must still have a little bit of the Quran left for the 30th day. And so when the moon is seen and the month has now ended at the end of the 29th day, what you have to do is to complete, excuse me, <laughs> complete that little bit to come to Khatam the Quran. And then uh, uh, you will then commence, recommence the Quran with Surah Al-Baqarah. So on the first day of Safar, I recited Surah to, after Surah Al-Fatih, I recited Surah Al-Baqarah. And then today, which is the second day, I have already recited Surah to Ali Imran. This is my Jews for the second day. And then my Jews for the third day, Jews means part. Uh, in the Farsi language, it says separa. The Arabic language is Jews. If you have, if you are reciting the Quran to complete the recitation every month, you have to recite the correct Jews for each day. My book has explained that. My book entitled "The Quran and the Moon: Methodology." for monthly recitation of the Qur'an. MashaAllah, I'm very happy 
with that book. And I thank, I thank Allah for the knowledge which he blessed me to with which to write that book. This book will explain to you how to recite the Quran and why to recite the Quran. And recite the Quran every day, every day. Meaning recite it, of course, in Arabic. <laughs> there is no Quran other than the Quran in Arabic. Um, if you recite the Quran, then that will prepare you to study the Quran. And when you recite the Quran, and then after that, when you study the Quran, then eventually you will fall in love with the Quran. Falling in love, it's a kind of a madness. I, I remember when I was a, a teenager, long, long, long ago, there were these romantic songs that we were teenagers, we used to sing about falling in love. <laughs> when, when you fall in love, you say, send me the pillow that you dream on so that I can dream on it too. It's a kind of madness. That is what we want with the Quran. That is precisely what we want with the Quran. To fall in love with the Quran, to fall in love with the book of Allah. That is our goal. That is our objective. And the first step on the way to fall in love with the Quran is to recite the Quran. If you can get someone to start reciting, to learn to recite the Quran in Arabic, and then to start reciting the Quran to complete it, no matter how long it takes, but every day you recite until you finish. You took more than a month, never mind. And then the next time you start over again and you take less time and less time until eventually you can easily complete the recitation of the Quran in one month, one lunar month. And you do that for the rest of your life. Imagine the amount of blessings that person would get who, who helped you and who guided you and who encouraged you and who supported you and who taught you to recite the Quran. Imagine, this is sadaqa jaria. You know, you dig a well. And you die. And people still get the water from the well. And you are in your grave and you continuously get blessings. Or you build a road. And after you die, people are still using that road to travel. And you are in your grave and you are still getting blessings. Are you listening to me? You're still getting blessings. Imagine that in your grave, even though the book is closed. But no, for three things, the book is still not closed. Number one, waladun salih, righteous children, whose conduct is righteous, and you get blessings for that. Number two, sadaqatun jariya, an act, of ch a charitable act for which from which blessings will continuously flow. Number three, al-munafiya, that you teach knowledge which is beneficial. And that blessing will continue in the grave. May Allah bless my teacher of blessed memory, Paulana, Dr. Muhammad Fadlur Rahman and Sari, who taught me and taught Maulana Siddiq Wa Nasir, taught Maulana Wafi Muhammad, uh, taught Sheikh uh, Ali Mustafa and others, Dr. Mohsin Ibrahim, my learned and distinguished brother, Dr. Abul Fadl Mohsin Ibrahim in Durban in South Africa. Allah's blessings, may Allah's blessings continuously flow on the soul of Maulana Dr. Muhammad Fadl Rahman Ansari, our teacher, who taught us, who gave us, who transmitted knowledge to us. And if you do the same thing with the Quran, imagine the knowledge, the blessings that will come to you. And so today I want to make an appeal, wherever in the world you may be and you listen. This book, the Quran and the Moon, I don't have it to show you as yet, but it is printed now. It's published, it's printed in Pakistan. 
the Quran and the Moon methodology for monthly recitation of the Quran. I believe it's the first of its kind. I don't know. I don't know of any book which I've never come across a book with this proper methodology for the recitation of the Quran. If there is, I'll be very happy to see it. Please send it to me. Send me the link to this book. Give me the name of the book. If there is a teacher who is taught the proper methodology for the recitation of the Quran monthly, please let me know who he is so I can mention his name and pray for Allah's blessings upon him. Yes. So this book is now printed, alhamdulillah. And now comes the next stage. We want to get the book to large numbers of people, particularly before the next Ramadan so that huge numbers will now be encouraged and excited when Ramadan comes for the first time in my life. I'm going to recite the whole Quran. For the first time in my life, I'm going to recite the Quran with the proper adza, the proper parts. The first Jews is Surah Al-Baqarah, the whole thing. The second Jews, Surah to Ali Imran, the whole thing. The third Jews, Surah to Nisa, the whole thing. The fourth Jews, Surah to Ma'ida, the whole, etc. Hmm? So now, in order for this book to reach large numbers of people around the world, in different languages, with being translated now uh, to French, I think the translation should soon be finished. It is being translated to... I think the German translation already completed, yes. Um, it's been translated to Malay, it's been translated to Urdu, it's been translated to Bangla and so on, different languages. Uh, what I need is, for, because the English book is already printed in Pakistan, so what I need is for people to order from me, the, order the book in bulk at a substantially reduced price. And when you order the book from me in bulk, then you give it out free of charge. Give it out as sadaka. Give it to people who would then read the book and be excited and be encouraged and be enthused and be, um, they will have this desire in their heart to now recite the Quran. And when they do read the book and they begin to recite the Quran, to complete it every month for the rest of their life, this is Sadaka Jariya for you and for me. And you'll be in your grave and you'll continue to receive um, blessings from this Sadaka Tal Jariya. Uh, you'll be able, when they read the book, they'll be able to understand the benefits of reciting the Quran, to khatam the Quran or to complete the Quran every month. Number one, Try it out. This is the age of which that prophecy has been fulfilled. Our prophet has said about one of the signs of Akhir al-Zaman, he said, time will move faster and faster. A whole day will pass like, a whole year will pass like a month. A whole month will pass like a week. A whole week will pass like a day, etc. Time is going to move faster and faster. Most of mankind will be living on the fast lane, the voie rapide, the fast lane of life. Hmm? And uh, <laughs> they can't live in the countryside. They just cannot bear life when it is slow, deliciously slow. No, they go crazy. <laughs> yes, <laughs> they go crazy when time is too, too slow. <laughs> So they need a fast lane of life. They are addicted to the fast lane of life. But when you recite the Quran, as it ought to be recited, time will no longer move faster and faster. You'll be out of the embrace of the Dajjal. Number two, if you recite the Quran, as it ought to be recited, then you get noor from Allah. Noor means light. That noor will enter the heart. 
And with that nur, you'll be able to see what otherwise cannot be seen. Political scientists don't know about this virus. The economist does not know about the virus. The sociologist and the psychologist doesn't know about the virus. The medical scientist doesn't know about this virus except on medical knowledge. But there are worlds beyond medical science. <laughs> And it is the world's beyond medical science. Iqbal, the poet said, Sitaro se aage jaha aur bhi hai. <laughs> there are many worlds beyond the stars, said Iqbal. Hmm? So it is there that the true explanation of the virus is located. And that's Islamic eschatology. So when you recite the Quran, Allah will bless you with nur, and with that nur you'll be able to see and recognize and understand what others cannot see and understand. Ask the scholars of Islam, the ones who are so popular, tell us something about the reality of this virus. They can't, unless and until. They're analyzing the virus from the perspective of Islamic eschatology, and they can't do that without nur. In addition, if you recite the Quran as it ought to be recited, Allah will give you shifa. And we have sent down in this Quran that which heals. All around us today we find so many, even young people who are ill, dangerously ill, painfully ill with so many different ailments, dying with cancer. Hmm? And yet there is Shifa in the Quran. The Quran can heal you. The Quran can give you your health back if you recite the Quran. There are those who listen to me and it makes no difference. But there are others whose hearts have not been sealed by Allah, who have not betrayed the truth to such an extent that Allah has sealed their hearts. Such people, they can still receive the message. And so if you recite the Quran, I'm saying to you, there is shifa. There is shifa or healing. Then tell them another of the blessings of reciting the Quran is that the Quran will protect you. وَإِذَا كَرَأْتَ Quran, And when you recite the Quran, جَعَلْنَا بَيْنَكَ وَبَيْنَ الَّذِينَ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ بِالْآخِرَةِ حِجَابًا مَسْتُورًا And when you recite the Quran, we place between you and that godless world, we place a hijab which covers you and therefore protects you. But in addition to all of these things, when you recite the Quran, it prepares you to study the Quran. You cannot study the Quran, forget it, unless you are first reciting the Quran. Where is the prof? Allah says in the Quran, uh, is it in Surah Al Qiyamah? Inna alayna jama'ahu wa Qur'ana. Allah is speaking to Nabi, Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wa salam, who is receiving revelations, wahi. And these are revelations on different, different subjects at different, different times, different, different lengths and so on. And Allah is saying to him, we are the ones who are going to bring it all together as a whole. Hmm. And as a recitation, we will do it. Inna alayna jama'ahu wa Qur'ana. Don't you worry, O Muhammad, alayhi <laughs> We're going to bring all of it together as a whole and as a recitation. And when we have brought it together as a whole, and when we have recited it, O Muhammad, alayhi salatu Now you must follow that way of recitation. 
ثم إن علينا بيعنا And then after that, O oh Muhammad it is our responsibility to provide the explanation of the Quran. And so it is, it is a proper methodology to first recite and then to study. Recitation comes first and study is dependent on continuous recitation. Nobody taught this to me. When I was a student of the Alimah Institute of Islamic Studies in Pakistan, no one ever taught this to me, no. And so send me an email if you'd like to order this book in bulk to be able to distribute it free of charge as Sadaqah Tunjariya. Send me an email, I'm telling you, we, will, we are printing in Pakistan where the price is cheaper to print and therefore we'll be able to give it to you at a very significant discount. And uh, I will then be able to arrange for printing in bulk, inshallah. So much time has already gone and I've only done two things so far. Number nine. The next one is, we come back to the virus. It will soon be one year now since the attack of the virus was launched in all of mankind. My first observation is that never before in history, in known human history, have all of mankind at the same time been affected by a plague or a virus. Never. Our Prophet, Allah's blessings be upon him, said, if you are in the place where the virus has attacked, do not leave. And if you are outside, do not enter. And so he, Nabi Muhammad, والسلام, he explained that there'll never be an occasion where all of mankind will be affected by the virus. There's no way <laughs> to escape it. And no way to get out. And no, for the first time today, because this is not a natural virus. No, this is a man, manufactured virus. That is why, for the first time in human history, you now have a virus which attacked all of mankind, the whole world at the same time. This is my first comment. Number two, since it is a manufactured virus by those who are monstrously evil, dangerously evil, relentlessly evil, may Allah destroy them. Since it was manufactured by evil people. The implication is they can manufacture the virus at varying degrees of strength and of danger. Uh, does the political scientist understand that? Does the economist understand that? Does the sociologist or psychologist or even the medicinal practitioner, do they understand that? No. What about our religious scholars? What about those who believe in the Quran and who have Muhammad is their teacher, their guide, their prophet? Do they understand that? Our scholars should have realized by now that this virus was manufactured to last a long, long time. Maybe the virus will remain with us for a few years. We are almost one year now, almost one year. Maybe it'll last for a few years. Could this be natural <laughs> or is this something designed by those who are our 
enemies and the enemies of mankind. Will you not think, instead of calling me names, the attack I want to suggest to you is intended to eventually decimate those who oppose Dajjal and who oppose his state of Israel. And so the, the weaker form of the virus will be launched amongst those who are more and more inclined towards be, being soft to Israel. But those who resist Israel, like the people of Pakistan, for example, who will never abandon, his, um, abandon the truth, and who will never recognize the state of Israel like uh, the United Arab Emirates, the, not the people, the evil government, not the people of Bahrain who are mostly Shia, but the evil government of Bahrain, which is a, an oppressor, hmm? oppressing the people of Bahrain. These are the ones who are recognizing Israel. Hmm? But the people are not. So those who resist Israel, like the Arabs, the majority of the Arabs, yes, not the governments. Tomorrow, of course, Saudi Arabia will rec recognize Israel. And those who took weapons and money from Saudi Arabia to wage their bogus jihad in Syria, you must be looking terrible now. Eh? <laughs> we warned you all the time, but you wouldn't listen to us. Tomorrow, Saudi Arabia will also recognize this. I said this in my book entitled The Religion of Abraham and the State of Israel, A View from the Quran. This book examined the subject of recognition, diplomatic recognition of the State of Israel. I did it maybe how much, 20-something years ago. Uh, and. Uh, the book was out of print, but now it is reprinted in Pakistan. Alhamdulillah. So when you order the complete set of books from me in Pakistan, you're going to get 30 books, including this one. So those who are recognizing the state of Israel are the ones who are on this side of the fence. But those who oppose Israel relentlessly, the, the followers of Nabi Muhammad والسلام, and the followers of Nabi Isa والسلام, these two ummas these are the ones who are going to be attacked most relentlessly with the, with the most vicious form of the virus that is still coming that is still coming and so our scholars should be understanding the, the eschatological explanation of the virus the virus is already successful in getting all of mankind to respond in the same way. You know, face mask. <laughs> we now live in a world of face masks. Yes, I, I, yes, I have to put on this thing on my face when I want to enter the supermarket or the market. I have to do that. If I want to go... Uh, any official building or so, I've got to put it on. But as soon as I'm out, I take it off. If I'm in my car and I'm alone in the car, no mask, none. But if there's a passenger in the car and you don't put on the mask, the police stop you, you're going to get a fine of a thousand, I don't know how many dollars. So it is a f universal phenomenon today of face masks. But in the house of Allah, in the masjid, are you going to enforce the law? Or you must put on a face mask to perform the salat? Well, let me tell you, that is bid'ah. If you don't know it, let me tell you, that is bid'ah. To, to establish a new law for salat. And that you have to stand five feet apart or three feet apart. You will never find me conducting a Jum'ah ah with people sitting three feet apart. Alhamdulillah, inshallah, I'll never do that. 
So this attack of the virus is meant to establish a world order which will advance the agenda of uh, control over the whole world. Get everybody to behave the same way, to live the same way. And then the virus has also come to do something psychological. That was sociological. This is psychological. To terrorize you, <laughs> to get you to become scared, to live with fear in your hearts. <laughs> And they, they become as, as scared as rabbits. <laughs> and from the time you become scared, you will do everything they ask you to do. You will dance to every tune they play. <laughs> and so it becomes so much easier for them to control all of mankind in one universal world order. Mm -hmm. These are some of the kinds of analysis that you will get from Islamic eschatology. The medical scientist doesn't know about that because, as Iqbal said, sitaro se aage jahan aur bhi hai. There are worlds beyond medical science, you know. Another of the implications of the virus is to weaken your group solidarity. When the month of Ramadan comes, that's the month where we build group solidarity, the solidarity of the community, of the Ummah. It is built, it is strengthened in Ramadan. Hmm? You don't want to fast for the whole day and then break your fast all alone. No. You want to come together. And everybody, the whole family sits together and you break the fast together. It's a wonderful time. It builds memories which last a lifetime. And so Ramadan is for group solidarity. And the virus is to destroy group solidarity and get people to live increasingly isolated lives. And as you break away from group solidarity, no longer you have the Salatul Jum'ah, where everybody come together. Hmm? And instead, you are now living isolated lives. Then, number one, you're no longer a sheep in a flock, <laughs> so the wolf can come and pick one by one. It's more easy to attack them. Number two, as you're living isolated lives, the mind can be damaged. And people will begin to suffer from mental illnesses, mental dislocation, and so on. And uh, uh, you, the, the, the virus has also come uh, in order to destroy not only the group solidarity, not only mental health, the virus has also come to destroy the economy in such a way that only the rich can eventually survive the virus. And all the rest will lose the means of livelihood, lose their capacity to maintain themselves, and will be now dependent on others. And when they turn off the tap, there's no more water. So when you are dependent on them with the water, and when they, do you know any time they turn off the tap, no water for you, you'll do everything you want, they want you to do. You'll do everything in order to get your water. <laughs> and so mankind can more easily be controlled when the virus has destroyed the, the economy in such a way that most of mankind become dependent rather than economically independent. And so it is eschatology which is explain, explaining the virus. Where are the scholars of Islam? Are they doing this? Are they explaining the virus? Or are they insisting that as soon as we get the permission, the massages are open, everybody must put on the face mask? Yes?
and they're insisting, put the sign out there. When you enter this masjid, you have to <laughs> social distance. Is that Islamic eschatology? Are these the people you consider as your maulanas and your muftis and the shuyukh? And when I teach them, these people are so shameless. Even though they know that this is the truth, they are so devoid of shame that they will not accept that what I'm saying is the truth and they will not preach the truth to others. Our response, my dear brothers and sisters, wherever you are, my first response to the virus is banish fear from your heart. I have never, ever, ever had fear in my heart from day one from this virus. I can't say to you something that I don't do myself. So banish fear from your heart. Number two, make sure you prepare the way to sustain yourself because the attack on the economy is formidable. This is just the beginning, eh? I think this virus is going to last for years. So the economy will eventually collapse. Only the rich will survive. So listen to me, please. Retreat to farming, food crops, dairy farming, if you can get close to the sea or to the river, the big rivers and fish which you can use to survive. Number, number three, haste and make haste with your effort to study and to understand the reality of the world today in which you are living. And you cannot do that without guidance from, the, from Allah. You cannot do that if you're a Muslim from the Quran. And one more thing. Our prophet said that the time will come when one man will have to maintain 50 women. And so last Ramadan, I said it. I said, reach out for our sisters who are living alone with none to maintain them. Reach out to them to maintain them. Reach out most of all to women with children who have no one to maintain them. And they have to look for a job to try to maintain themselves and their children. I said, look, look out for them and try to maintain them. This is your priority at this time while this virus is raging. These women may not come to you to seek help but you must search out for them and try to reach out to them and help them and maintain them. And if you can marry, that is even better. But the Quran says, if you fear you cannot maintain them equitably, then stay with only one wife. Stay with only one wife. But if you can, then do me, make the means. Marry them. Do not be afraid to marry if you have the means to do so. And if the godless world says, good men have only one wife, tell the godless world, get lost. Uh, and so here is our response uh, to the virus. And uh, uh, I mentioned earlier that United Arab Emirates, uh, excuse me, The United Arab Emirates and Bahrain have now extended diplomatic relations, uh, recognition, sorry, to Israel. And uh, I anticipate that this is meant to prepare the way for Saudi Arabia because that's the main one. And when the Saudis extend recognition to Israel, which is just a matter of time, then what is the validity of your Hajj? I have not performed the Hajj, although I'm now 81 years of age by the moon. Why have I not performed the Hajj? Long years ago, I recognized the Hajj was not valid. But will you, who insist that the Hajj is still valid, would you still do so when Israel 
recognizes, sorry, when Saudi Arabia recognizes Israel? Read my book. Read my book entitled The Religion of Abraham and the State of Israel, a view from the Quran. And there you will find the evidence that recognizing the state of Israel is an act of shirk. So would you still recognize the Hajj to be valid? I have put aside the money for my Hajj in Goldie now, years ago. If I'm alive and the Hajj is liberated from these traitors, I can say so. But those scholars in the United States of America, can they say so? Illa mashallah. When the Hajj is liberated from these traitors, if I'm alive, then alhamdulillah, I perform the Hajj. And if I'm not alive, then others can perform the Hajj on my behalf. That's valid. But the money for the Hajj is already put aside in dinar. Hmm? And so my comment to you on the diplomatic recognition of the state of Israel by the UAE and by Bahrain is a wake-up call for Pakistan. Pakistan, excuse me, <laughs> every time you make a critical comment about the government of Pakistan, there'll be those who'll be jumping up and declaring anti-Pakistani. <laughs> These are the nationalists. These are the nationalists. They, their greatest loyalty is to the state and not to the truth. <laughs> but not all Pakistanis are that stupid. The, the state of Pakistan has been, the, sorry, the government of Pakistan has been sitting on the fence for years and years and years and years. They, they, they want to keep good relations with Saudi and good relations with the United States and good relations with Iran sitting on the fence. And now the curtain is coming down for Pakistan because it's just a matter of time. The foreign ministry in Islamabad probably is still sleeping, but it's just a matter of time before Saudi Arabia now extends diplomatic recognition to the state of Israel. And when she does that, Allah says in the Quran, وَمَنْ يَتَوَلَّهُ مِنْكُمْ فَإِنَّهُ مِنْهُمْ Whosoever from amongst you turn to them, with friendship and alliance, you belong to them, you don't belong to us anymore. We've been telling Pakistan for the longest while. We've been telling them only the Quran can take you out of your perilous situation in which you're located. But I don't know whether they teach the Quran at Oxford University. Now then, we have little time left, and I want to turn to a subject which um, uh, someone, a local politician, he listened to me two weeks ago, and the local Muslim politician, he said, Maulana, we want a lecture for you on, on the U.S. elections. And here's my comment in the little time we now have left on the coming U.S. elections of the year 2020. We are just over 40 days away from the elections. What are the implications of the elections? Well, from our Islamic eschatological perspective. Is it Trump or Biden? And five, four years ago, was it Trump or Hillary Clinton? Who are those who are anxious for war with Russia and war with China? Is it, was it Trump or Clinton? The schoolboy will say both of them. <laughs> That's the schoolboy, so forget the schoolboy is useless. It could not have been Trump because four years of Trump and we are no closer to war with Russia as we were four years ago. So obviously, all would recognize that Trump did not want war with Russia. It was Clinton who wanted war with Russia. 
Is that a fair comment? Does that make me a supporter of Trump? No. <laughs> it's just the truth. And now, <laughs> in the choice between Trump and Biden, the former senator for many, many, many years, he's been a senator in the U.S. Senate. Who is the warmonger of these two? Answer, it is Biden who would want war with Russia, not Trump. And so in a, in a choice between Trump and Biden, the warmongers, the ones who are uh, lusting for war with Russia, would want Biden as, pre 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 as president. So in the event that Trump loses the election, the implication of the U.S. elections coming up in November is that in the event that Trump loses the election, we'll now be much closer to nuclear war. Is that a fair response? Is that a fair answer? Is that a fair analysis? I don't think there's anything wrong with this analysis at all. But you know the schoolboy. But what happens if Trump wins the election? My answer is the Jal wants war. He wants the nuclear war. Because he wants to transit from Pax Americana to Pax Judaica. The political scientist does not know that. The military strategist does not know that. The historian does not know that. Only the eschatologist knows that. So if Trump wins the election, in the unlikely event that Trump wins the election, then we anticipate, this is our analysis, civil war in the United States. Either way, either way, they must get what they want, war with Russia. Uh, if there's civil war in the United States, you wouldn't want to be living in the cities of the United States. No. If there's going to be civil war in the United States, if there's going to be popular unrest and, and anarchy in the United States, then my advice to you, of course, I know the Maulanas and the Muftis, they're not going to listen to me. And those who are attached to their masjid and their Maulana, their Muftis and so on, and their social distances and their Facebook, they're not going to listen to me. But there are others who have sense in their head. They're not cattle. And they're listening to me. And I say to you, you have from now until... November the election, to so try to get somewhere in the remote countryside. Somewhere in the remote countryside where you can escape with your family to safety. Because in the event that Trump wins the election, there's going to be civil war in the United States. There's going to be anarchy. They would not want him to be able to rule anymore. Does the Quran provide us any guidance? As the world draws new, nearer to nuclear war, here is this book. The Quran, the Great War, and the West. This is my very small analysis of the nuclear war, which is coming. And this is Constantinople in the Quran, which is being, uh, which is tra being translated to Greek and being printed in Greece, alhamdulillah. Uh, the, re the reason why we are turning to the Quran for an explanation of the U.S. elections is because we know that this U.S. election is more important than any before it because this is the prelude to nuclear war. Why is it that Muslims in politics you know, the Muslim politicians. <laughs> we even have them here in Trinidad. Why are they so scared of the Quran? Have you no shame? You call yourself a Muslim? Eh? And you're scared of the Quran? Because the Quran is uh, yeah, it's something uncomfortable for you in your political life? Hmm? The politicians don't want to study the Quran. The Muslims who are ruling over us and the world of Islam, they don't want to study the Quran. They betray the Quran in Kosovo. They betray the Quran in the Balkan Peninsula, the Muslims who rule over us. They betray the Quran in Turkey. 
They betrayed the Quran in the United Arab Emirates and Bahrain. And they betrayed the Quran in Saudi Arabia. What does Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam say about the post-nuclear world which will come after the next elections? Answer, we are now in the last countdown of history. We are now in the last countdown of history. And the U.S. elections is a significant event triggering the last countdown of history. The last countdown of history has as its centerpiece the Great War. We call it the Melhama. Our brothers call it Armageddon. The great war is coming and our scholars are asleep. They make no mention of it at all, not even in the khutbah, not in the public writings and the public lectures. They are silent on the subject. And this is why our prophet said that they will be the worst people beneath the sky. مِنْ عِنْدِهِمْ تَخْرُجُ الْفِتْنَةِ وَفِيهِمْ تَعْوُجُ And they will be the centers of corruption of the people. I hope they're listening to me. The last countdown of history and the U.S. elections because after the Great War comes the conquest of Constantinople and the conquest of Jerusalem. And let me say one thing about this. That it is a Muslim army which will conquer Constantinople. Our Christian brothers must understand this. If a Christian power attempts to conquer Constantinople, like Russia, it will trigger off civil war in the house of religion, Muslims against Christians. A very foolish thing to do for Russia to attack Constantinople to conquer it. No, it is a Muslim army which will conquer Constantinople. And it is a Muslim army which will conquer Jerusalem because our prophet said, Allah's blessings be upon him, I'm sorry I have to speak so rapidly. You will most certainly fight the Jews and you will kill them, you will conquer them, you will defeat them to such an extent that the stones and the rocks will speak and say, Muslim, there's a Jew hiding behind me. Which Jew? The Jew who is the oppressor, not the Jew who is standing upright for righteous conduct. There's a Jew hiding behind me, so come and kill him because he ought to be killed as an oppressor. Hmm? So it is a Muslim army which will conquer Jerusalem and a Muslim army which will conquer Constantinople. And so the end of history, the last countdown of history is a, is a time which you see the Ummah of Muhammad rising once again in two parts of the world, in Constantinople, and in Jerusalem. And that paves the way for Nabi Isa Islam, Jesus to return. This is all that we have for today because time is up. But we pray and we hope that you answer our prayer, Allah. And we'll get our orders from you, wherever you are, to get my book, The Quran and the Moon, Methodology for Monthly Recitation of the Quran, that you'll order it in bulk, in thousands if possible, and then distribute them free of charge all over the world, so that by next Ramadan, inshallah, there'll be thousands and thousands and thousands who will now recite the Quran all to Ramadan, to khatam the Quran in Ramadan, as it ought to be recited. Thank you. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.